All right, hi, welcome back, Attorney Steve Honor, and welcome to another exciting episode of Litigation Whiteboard. All right, Attorney Steve Honor here with you. Today we're tackling an interesting topic called the Economic Loss Doctrine. Now, you need to just kind of be aware of this. A lot of times this may only show up in like insurance subrogation, where an insurance company gets hired. Uh, basically, an insurance company pays a claim, then they have a law firm that goes back and tries to figure out who to sue and how to get recoup their damages. But it can apply in other circumstances. There's a split amongst the states. There's a majority. There's a minority. Without further ado, let's head to the Attorney Steve Litigation Whiteboard. Boom, here we go, all right. So um, in, in the law, we have a difference between contracts and torts. Contracts are basically written or verbal agreements that are based on promises. I promise to do this for you. I promise to build you a pool. I promise to mow your lawn. I promise to do that. If you breach the promise, then that is called a breach of contract in which case the non-breaching party, which would typically be the plaintiff in a litigation, would sue for breach of contract, seeking their consequential damages, the benefit of the bargain, the position they would have been in had the contract been performed, and so forth and whatnot. And that can include economic losses, loss, things that are foreseeable, lost pay, lost wages, lost this, damage to this, damage to that. However, there's an economic uh, loss doctrine that comes into play that can prevent you from seeking to recover in tort law. Sometimes you may say, well, this guy, this toaster damaged my house. The whole, I have all this economic damage. I lost a tenant. I did this. I did that. If you're under contract, you may be prohibited from also seeking tort damages, other damages. That's really what the, elect, uh, the economic loss doctrine is about, kind of trying to keep con contracts remedies and tort remedies separate. So let's take a further look at his. Okay, here's your plaintiff, here's your aggrieved party upset, something bad happened. Contract, as I mentioned, these are promise-based. One party makes a promise to the other, offeror, offeree, promise or promisee, acceptance, consideration, that whole thing. Now, again, here, contract can cover foreseeable damages, including economic losses, okay? So if you're in a, con you're in a contract, let's say you're in a contract down here with um, an architect to build you a house, this final example down here. The architect signs a contract. He says, we're gonna do this. It's gonna be a great house. It's gonna be up to workmanlike conditions, things like that. And then th there's a breach. Uh, there's negligent design, they screwed it all up, and now the whole house comes down the day after you get the keys. What do you do? Do you sue in tort? Do you sue in contract? Is it negligent? Sure seems like it. Um, this is duty-based. Tort, negligence, things like that are duty-based, okay? So yeah, it seems like maybe there is some kind of breach of duty here by the architect, but the architect entered into a contract with you, so you may be limited under the economic loss doctrine might be raised as a defense. You may be limited from suing also over here in negligence. They say the economic loss doctrine may bar that tort claim, okay? And this could be all kinds of different torts. There's, you know, there's, I don't know, seven or so uh, intentional torts. There's fraud, misrepresentation, assault, battery, all kinds of things, conversions in there. So, um, but anyway, in this circumstance, the architect example, they may be barred from pursuing in tort. And the contract may say, well, um, we're only limiting our, our um, losses to the amount you paid us, okay? So this is very important when you're a transactional attorney, you're trying to figure out what is the best way to guard against this economic loss doctrine. Well, put in here in your contract, uh, this is not legal advice, by the way, but put in your contract that um, you're going to limit damages. The other party should say, no, we're not going to limit damages. Damages will be any, any damages that you cause, okay, that you are the, the legal cause of. So that's one example of how the economic loss doctrine may work. You have a contract. They're not going to let you go over here, all right? Another one I have here. Say you have a neighbor who's excavating, and the neighbor's down there. He's blowing up his backyard, going to put in a nice casita out there in the backyard, and got the zoning rights and everything. And so they're excavating, boom, blowing up some things. Now you're the next door neighbor, a big old chunk of rock comes through your, your uh, window, your kitchen window, destroys your sink, 
so happens that that's the unit that your tenant is renting. Now you got to get the tenant out of there. You got to put the tenant in another place. You got to do all that stuff. Well, what happens if the, the um, excavating neighbor says, sorry, you can't pursue me in tort, which is duty based. Um, I have a contract with your neighbor. Well, you say you don't have a contract with me. I'm not in privity of contract with you. So I am able to go over here and sue you in tort because I was in the foreseeable zone of danger. You owed a duty to me to make sure your blasting was done. And also that's an abnormally dangerous activity, right? So things like that, you can still go and sue in tort, recover all kinds of damages and so forth and so on. That's another example. Um, here, let's take another example. You have a hair dryer. Your hair dryer blows up and it causes only, the only damage it causes is to the hair dryer. Okay, under that circumstances, you're probably, this again, this is kind of the strict products liability where everybody up and the down the chain can be sued, the retailer, the distributor, the manufacturer, but you may be limited in that circumstances to your contractual remedies, which is you buy the product, comes with a warranty, says it's worth 18 months of warranty, and that can affect your statute of limitations. So maybe if it happens in two years, they say, sorry, the economic loss doctrine bars your purely economic loss in the hair dryer. Sorry, yeah, you're out of a couple hundred bucks. Some of these Dyson hair dryers, four, five, six hundred bucks. So you're out, you're, you're out your economic damages. You can't sue in tort for purely economic damages. It's a strict liability type of case. Sorry. So that's another way the economic loss doctrine can work. Okay. So again, it's a, the idea is to separate the tort remedies from the contract remedies, benefit of your bargains. Now, there are exceptions where there's in fact a lot of exceptions. And again, it depends on your jurisdiction. If you end up in a situation where you hear somebody say economic loss doctrine, go and do the research in your jurisdiction. There are a lot of nuances. There's a lot of different this, that, and the other. Um, there's some exceptions when you have only economic loss that you can still seek a remedy in your tort claims. Okay, let's go over some of those. One, if there was a contract, but it was fraudulently induced. Okay, now the one reason you may want to get over here to the tort world is you get punitive damages for oppressive and malicious types of conduct. So it's beautiful you can get over here because generally in contract law, unless it's bad faith insurance by an insurance company, it's very difficult to get punitive damages. So it's one good reason if somebody's really disregarding your rights, malicious, oppressive, fraudulent, or use usually the terms we use in California, Civil Code 3294. Um, fraudulent inducement, you can still go over here and sue for your tort and all your damages. Um, and again, not where there's not a construction defect, many states will limit this to construction defect or strict products liability types of cases. So if it's not one of those, you may be fine. Again, check your rules. Um, if there is no contract, you say, well, I'm not into, this is the case of this person over here, the, uh, the neighbor of the excavator. They're not in privity of contract with the excavation company. So there's no contract with them. They're not barred. Um, equities, there are some exceptions when equity requires. Tort law promotes an interest in providing a settlement. So there's some all, you know, little equity arguments you can make. A statute allows you to sue. For example, say you're a victim of consumer fraud. In Arizona, there's the Consumer Fraud Act. So if a statute gives you grounds to sue, check it out. That may be a way to get over here in tort. Maybe get to the punitive damages. Ring the bell, ding, ding. Um, finally, if there's damage to other person or property, in other words, it's not merely economic loss. There's also personal or property damage to accompany the loss. Then you may be able to get over here to tort law. Okay. And the goodies. All right. So guys, that's a, just a real general, uh, discussion of the economic loss doctrine it can be a little complicated, but it doesn't have to be separating the remedies, deciding which one is the predominant claim. And are there any rules prohibiting any exceptions? Bingo. There you have it. I hope this has been helpful for you. This is general legal information only, not legal advice. You need some help with litigation, civil litigation, business, real estate, intellectual property law. You know where to find us on the web at attorneysteve.com. That's attorneysteve.com, the first name in legal services. Thanks for watching, y'all. Gotta run. Take care.